coming back to. Well, welcome to the gathering. Um, I'm going to put everybody on mute just so I can hear myself uh, try to listen to the small, still voice of whatever spirit is speaking. <laughs> I hope it's the Holy Spirit. We'll hope and pray that that's it. So um, we have some, I have some nice new friends on the gathering today. And, uh, you know, I suppose if somebody ever watches this on YouTube, there will be new people coming to uh, this video um, whenever it shows. So it's always good to kind of kind of start from the beginning. I that my two new friends on the video today or on the gathering through the Zoom uh, are familiar with the world of uh, recovery from addictions. And in a, in a certain sense, you could say that uh, what, what, what religious people, or at least in the Christian world, sometimes call original sin is um, being, <laughs> you could, in, a, in a very simple way, a very practical way, a very down-to-earth way, you could imagine original sin um, as being um, uh, addicted to a, um, to, a, to a view of reality that is not in concert with reality as it actually is. In other words, um, until we have some really earth-shaking life experiences, we think we're seeing the world as it is. And then usually, or if, if with God's grace, sometimes it happens that something happens to us that suddenly awakens us to the fact that we're not looking at the world as it is, we're looking at the world as we would like it to be. And that there is an uh, kind of a, an, un, an unacknowledged form of control and expectation that we have kind of grown up with or inherited for some, from somebody or internalized from somebody. And very often that has a deep religious element in it. And that's what we try to address in the Wednesday gatherings to some extent. But I like to start wherever people are, because um, in trying to introduce um, for those of you who have not been here before, basically what the gathering is doing is introducing a new, um, a new vision of our relationship with God. Some people call it the higher power. Some people don't call it anything. Some people don't even believe that there is such a thing. And I have to say that there is no such thing as God. There is a mystery in which we all live and move our and have our being that people describe as God, but God is not an object out there with the other objects of the world. God, whatever God is, it's, it's, it's a power or a mystery. I always like to prefer the word mystery. That's the word St. Paul uses a lot. This mystery, he said, which we are talking to you about, has been hidden since the foundation of the world, but somehow in the advent of the one that we call the Christ, the mystery of the world as it is in truth, as it is in God, as it was from the beginning, as it is beyond and beneath and uh, other than your own expectations of what you think it is. Reality is never what I think it is. Uh, when, I, when I'm looking at the world, I see the world as I am, not as the world is. So if I am miserable with myself, everybody looks like an enemy or a potential threat. If I'm dissatisfied with myself, God looks like he's dissatisfied with me. So much of what we call religion or theology, and this is why the modern world has basically discarded it. Most of it is fairly commonly acknowledged to be simply a projection of addicted human beings who have a screwy way of looking at the world to begin with. So then they take their own foul moods and their own uh, manic depressive illness, and they project it upon God, and they say that God is just as vol volatile in his relationship with us as we are with each other. But what if it were otherwise? What if God were a mystery of which, which all of us in some kind of intellectual sense already kind of know? What if, what if God were other than that? What if God were completely other from ourselves? What, what if we were made in the image and likeness of God, 
but through history, we have acquired a distorted view of who we are, and therefore a distorted view of who God is. That's actually what original sin is referring to, that somehow in the historical process, people have lost touch with their derivative existence coming from God. They, we were all created by God. Every breath that we take comes to us from a power greater than ourselves. And this is mythically portrayed in the book of Genesis, of course, where Adam breathes, or God breathes into Adam and takes a bag of dust and water and makes it a living person. So I'm getting a little ahead of myself here. So I'm just trying to say you can start start with anything. And, and, and people who are recovering from addiction and people who have had a who have had a life changing, you know, I, I love that movie. My friend Tom and I are both we're both baseball players. I suppose both are in our bones still. Uh, but there was a great movie called The Natural, and I guess my friend Tom is living this out in a couple of different ways because towards the end of his life, the the Natural, who was a baseball player who in his forties finally got his big break into the major leagues and hit nine consecutive home runs when his first nine at bats and was a phenom and uh, you know and finally is in his element and he finally comes back and finally discovers the woman that he all, loved all along and he had known her way back when but because of his career, he had let her go and pursued his own path, and she had a, a difficult journey, and he had a difficult journey, but in the end, uh, they got back together, and um, he says, boy, I, I feel terrible about all the wasted time, and she says, well, the way I've got it figured is we each have two lives. We have one life to learn and one life to live, and what we call a religious conversion or any kind of recovery from an addiction is a kind of awakening. I awaken to the fact that the way I was living, which means the way I was perceiving the world and then perceiving the world beyond this world that gives source to this world, the way I was perceiving it got me where I was. So it can't be all, all right. You know, I remember walking into my first AA meeting thinking I knew it all about addiction, you know, because I was a counselor in the addiction fields. And after I talked for a while, uh, the guy sitting next to me said, uh, can I give you a, a suggestion? And he said, actually, I'd like to give you two suggestions. And I said, sure. And he says, um, he says, well, the first one is, he says, if you keep coming back here for a while, he says, um, he listened to me talk for a while, you know, with all my head knowledge about addiction. And he said, well, he says, if you come back after you come back here for a few weeks, he says, you're going to be sitting in a meeting one day and you're going to hear a big pop. You're going to look around. You'll think somebody fired a gun. And he said, it'll just be your head coming out of your ass. He says, and the world won't look so brown to you anymore. <laughs> And he says, the other thing, he says, don't take this wrong. He says, but the next time we want some of your shit, we'll unscrew your head and dip it out. He says, why don't you keep your mouth closed for a while? That's what we call an old timer in AA, you know? <laughs> but the point is that, that some people awaken easily and some people need to be hit over the head with a two by four, or they need to fall face down in the gutter, or some people actually need to die. I, um, I, my secretary wanted to make sure I shared this with everybody on the gathering today because I so often refer, because I'm trying to present a more ancient version of Christianity, one that I, the, the one that I believe if it were really heard could not be rejected, would be, would be, would be, would be, a pe it would be, people would be drawn to it like a dying man in the desert is drawn to the oasis that he sees in the distance. And, and, and sadly, I mean, I always knew some version of Christianity, like the one that I'm trying to present, which is not mine at all. It comes, comes from the Eastern Catholic and Orthodox churches of the world, the most ancient churches in the world, the most ancient spirituality in the world was all around the Eastern coast of the Mediterranean basin, moving over almost to China and all the way down to India, all, all the way down into Africa. Ethiopia was one of the earliest centers of Christianity. And there was a vision there 
of what the world was in God and who God truly is, which, and that's the, that's the point about Christianity. It comes, it comes into the world as something completely different and an indictment, both an indictment and, an, and, a, and a kind of redemption or a corrective to all the previous religious ways of imagining God that were existent in the world. Christianity comes like a nuclear explosion into the world to blow up the existing religious and social structure that existed there and put the pieces back together in a way that resembles the life of God himself, which Jesus referred to as the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God has come, but it's come like an explosion. And it absolutely obliterates. That's why they put Jesus to death on the cross. They recognized he is a mortal threat to everything that we believe. Pilate and Caiaphas became friends the day that they both decided this man has to die because they recognized that he was introducing into the world a vision of humanity, of God and humanity to an intimacy with God that made men and women small gods with G's. You are children of my father. My father is your father. I mean, I'll go on. What we do in the gathering is I elaborate on that at great length and go into great depth about that. But right now, I just want to make the point that there was the world, as it were, was unconsciously mired in an addictive way of thinking about God and themselves that resulted in violence from the very beginning since Cain killed Abel in the garden. And Christ comes into the world with a vision and, and with he, he, it's, he does, Christ doesn't really even have a message. He is the message. He is the incarnation of what humanity is in God's eyes and what we are all meant to be and how far astray we have wandered from that in our ignorance and our addictive thinking and behaving. It's as if Christ is a sober person who walks into a group of drunks and shows them what the human being look fully alive is supposed to look like and how they were designed in the beginning. And by virtue of the contrast, two things happen. There's an indictment of myself without anybody indicting me. The man who comes in sober, the perfectly clean and sober and, and, and put together person comes in, he's not saying a word at all. He's coming in because he has mercy and pity for the people who are still face down in the alcohol or the food or the drugs or whatever it might be. And he's trying to show them, take a look at me. I am a mirror of yourself. This is how my father sees you. As you see me, the father sees you, but you do not see yourself that way. So there's both an indictment of myself in the presence of God, and then there is immediate hope that for the first time in my life, it suddenly occurs to me, I may not be destined to die like this. Okay, so I'm just relating it to addiction now because it's an easy parallel for what I'm talking about, but globalize what I'm saying here. Christianity introduces into the world a light that the world had not seen before, and it renders all of the other lights. What One of the early church fathers compared Christianity to like the sun rising in the morning, and prior to the sun rising, suppose we had a world where the sun never rose, and we were living in darkness. That's the meaning of original sin. We're living in darkness from the beginning of the, of, of the days. God moved over the darkness. And people were living in darkness after what we describe as the, the, the fall or the original sin of the Garden of Eden. And we've done many gatherings on that. I'm not going to go through that again. But that simply is a mythological reference to the fact that for whatever reason and in whatever way it came about, humanity from the beginning of humanity has been in darkness about human nature as we should relate to each other and what has taken its place is the kind of Cain and Abel violence that we see starting in the Old Testament and moving all the way up to the present day where the Ukrainians are killing the Russians and, and the Americans are trying to defend themselves against their mortal enemies. So the, 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 the logic of the world is the addictive thinking of violence. Basically, you fuck, you, excuse me, you screw with me, we're, we're gonna screw with you. You hit me, I'm gonna hit you back 10 times as hard. And I, so even in Israel, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth was a huge improvement on 10,000 eyes for an eye. You take one of ours, we're going to wipe out your whole GD tribe. 
Okay, that's the, that's the logic of the world. Getting even with people is the logic of the world. Christ comes into the world with a completely different logic. As if, and I'm not a technological guru here, but it's like replacing Lent, Lent, Linux with Fortran. You know, there's, there's different computer languages out there and everybody's got their system set up in this one language. And then comes this computer genius and he says, you're doing it the wrong way. Here's another way. It'll give you not artificial intelligence. It'll give you supernatural intelligence. Here, try running this program. Okay. Now, Christ was really trying to install, to, you, to switch metaphors here for a minute, I do have an MA, Master of Analogies. So, you know, and, and my leading quality, the thing I'm most proud of is my humility. So just bear that in mind as we move forward here. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the analogies are helpful because all Jesus did was teach in analogies. So Christ, as, as it were, is trying to install a, a different operating system in the mind and heart of the world. Another analogy that I often use in homilies is when you go to church, which Pope Francis described as a hospital for sinners, God sees you in your addictive, poisonous, broken down, evil, darkened, uh, miserable, self-hating condition. And he says, hmm, you are, you are, you are mortally sick here. <laughs> and he says it with a sense of humor, too, because he never sees people, he never see God never sees people in the condition they are. He sees them always in the condition that he made them and the glory for which he made them. And it will happen one way or another. I, 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 I did plan in part going, in, going into why, why in the end everyone necessarily will be delivered from their addictions and the light will come on and the awakening will occur and the darkness will be banished for every single creature God ever created. And I'll do an entirely separate gathering on that. And I'll, But I'm, what I'm trying to do here today is I want to try to lay out the framework in which a vision like that could be possible because that was also a constituent piece of the early vision of, of Christianity and the world and the salvation of the world, the, 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 the coming to sobriety of the world, the, the recovery of the world from their original fall into the mire and the muck. I mean, addiction is a very apt metaphor for the transition. Recovery is what we call the, the spiritual life. The spiritual life is an intentional cultivation of recovery from a fundamentally distorted way of looking at myself, others, God, and the world. And it's not an overnight process. The awakening may be overnight. The, the event that awakens me may be overnight. But as I, as I mentioned earlier, relapse and addiction is a very constituent part of the process. People have the awakening. They see, I want to look like that guy. I want to have my life back. I want to have my wife back. I want to have my kids back. I want to have my, I want to be what I was before. And then they try to take a step down that road and the, and, and the, and the detox process, not just from the chemicals, but from the whole way of thinking, and in my program, we say it's a food program for food addicts. I come for the I come for the vanity. I want to lose the weight and I want to look thin again. I come for the vanity, but I stay for the sanity. In other words, I have to detox not from the alcohol and the drugs alone. That's just the beginning, and that's that kills most people. <laughs> I mean, just trying to get off the shit kills most people. And it, I mean, that is to say, it either kills them because, and, and that's how some people awaken. I mean, an alcoholic at the bottom of the barrel says, if I keep drinking, I'm going to die. And if I stop, I'm going to die. I'm, I, I have, I'm, and they, we, they talk about it as seeking the easier, softer way, but you get into that cul-de-sac and there is no either, either, either easier, softer way. You either go through the hell of withdrawal or you go through the hell of keep drinking. It's one hell or take your, take, pick your poison here. Okay. And that's why, so, so, but the awakening is a person's redemption, but notice every time I come to redemption, I have to go through hell to get there. Hell and redemption are not opposite states of being. They are two sides to the exact same mystery. 
to get what I desire to have, I have to be shorn. I have to be detoxed. I have to be stripped. And in Christianity and in, in what we're doing with the gathering, this is why you know, I always get ahead of myself and, and, and I can't put 50 years of osmosis from my heart and mind into yours just like that. But it, but it's it's a it's a it the detox process and then the reacquisition of a new framework of an entirely new logic and integrating that people in recovery will tell you this ten years of recovery is much different than one year of recovery it, to learn you know it's like going to France you can you can you can learn French but to become French takes years and years and years you don't you don't become a Christian overnight you certainly don't become a Christian by saying I take Jesus as my Lord and Savior, that'd be like me going into a, a mechanic's garage and say I'm now an auto mechanic because I'm standing in a garage. You can, you can no sooner become a Christian by going to church than I can become an auto mechanic by walking into a garage. It just doesn't work that way. It's not something that happens extrinsically. All the extrinsic accoutrements of religion are there to give you an apprenticeship in self-mastery, and more than in self-mastery, an apprenticeship of, it's really, it's really, a, a Paul put it perfectly, because it happened to him in an instant, but for most of us, it take, well, it took years for him as well. Paul put it, put it this way, he said, the, the transformation is acquiring the mind of Christ. Jesus, when he's speaking to Peter, and Peter says, you're never going to die. You're the Messiah. Jesus looks at him and says, get behind me, Satan. You are, and here's the key line, you are thinking like human beings do, not like God does. In other words, before the advent of Christ, the whole of humanity was mired in the addiction of, 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 of darkened thinking and, and murderous, violent action. And that logic is what still governs this world. So Christianity is, it, this is why I talk to my friend Rob a lot about this. This is, and, and we have a respectful, I suppose, disagreement in some ways about this. The church is not meant to be the adversary of culture. I am not, and I'll come back to the addiction metaphor for a minute. Nobody who is truly sober, and, and for my, uh, the purpose of our analogy, nobody who has been totally incorporated into the life of Christ has anything other than love for the person who, who persons who are being violent to themselves and to others still mired in the addiction. What they say to themselves is, but for the grace of God, there go I. Now that takes many years to move from, I hate alcoholics, I hate drug addicts, I hate myself when I'm a drug addict, the look at those stupid idiots still doing what I did for years. That's a kind of a natural disposition because it's been part of my negative thinking from the beginning. The addiction, I love the phrase in AA that we use. It's not the drinking that makes me stinking. It's the stinking thinking that gets me drinking. <laughs> it's because I have such a jaundiced view of reality and, and, and my view of God very often gets screwed down on top of that. It's of a piece. My view of God is just as jaundiced before the revelation of Christ, before the apocalypse of Christ. Apocalypse, the word apocalypse means unveiling. Before Christ unveiled to the world or pulled the veil back, you remember when he died, the veil in the temple split in two. That, that's a symbolic uh, utterance to show you that when he died, when he offered no resistance to evil and conquered evil, not by opposing it, but by offering an alternative to it, even at the cost of his own life. And his resurrection was a vindication of his victory over death and evil. He's offering the world a completely different uh, uh, alternative to the way they do life, to the way they do God, to the way they do social organization. He's offering them an alternative. But to the powers of this world, what Paul described as the powers and principalities of this world, they will have none of it because it's a complete threat 
to the way they do it. And to fight evil with evil, to, to have an adversarial Christianity, to have a militant Catholicism is to bark up the wrong tree. You're picking up the instruments of Satan to cast out Satan. And that's why Jesus says, can Satan cast out himself? No, you cannot fight evil with evil. My mother told me this in second grade. She said, Philip, I said, he hit me. I'm going to hit him back. He'll get, I'm going to bloody his nose. He'll never do that to me again. That is original sin in a nutshell. It is the logic of the world. People are paid great amounts of money to ensure that this logic obtains both in business and in government. Get there before the selfish people and do whatever you need to do to make it happen. And don't let anybody tell you what to do. That's the world's logic. It takes a lifetime, two lifetimes, maybe 45 years in what we call purgatory, which means 45 years going to meetings, hanging around people who, find, who have it. I don't have it. I recognize I don't have it. I'm hanging around people who do have it. I don't know how they have it. All I know is that they have what I want, and I don't know how the hell to get it. And every time I try to get it, I try to get it with the old tools that got me where I am. So when you do what you did, you'll get what you got. And insanity is doing the same things, expecting different results. Well, most world, most religion in people's lives is that hamster cage of running those same ideas about God through their mind and then trying to battle the world or battle the society or battle the culture with the weapons of light. You can't do that. You turn, you, you turn into an instrument of darkness when you try to fight the darkness. Everything that is resisted only grows stronger. So for a person who's really, really happy, joyous, and free through recovery from addiction, they never preach at another alcoholic. They never indict another alcoholic. They never judge another alcoholic. They have nothing but compassion. They're like Jesus. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. I can't do what I do if it brings me to hell knowing what is good for me. I did. It's impossible for me ever to do anything that I don't think is good for me but I can be quite deceived about what is truly good for me. And when my mistaken notions of the good lead me straight into the hell of addiction or some other hellish situation that I'm in, it makes me question whether my notion of what is good is truly good. And, and even in that, I'm still desiring the good, but I see that I have chosen something that while it appeared to me to be good at the time, has proven to be just the opposite. That's why all sin is a good choice made in a deceptive manner. And when the deception is revealed, the sin dissolves. Redemption occurs and the person is set free from the slavery to sin, to addiction, which is all about being set free from deception. When I finally see with the clear eyes of God's light, I see that I was living in darkness. And even to admit that I'm in darkness is to already to have gone a great distance towards the light. Okay, so this stuff is very subtle at the spiritual level, and it takes a long time to acclimate to it. Now, the entire religion, the entire world prior to the coming of Christ was encased in a get even logic, both with respect of God to the world and the world to itself. You do, you do right by me, I may do right by you. You do bad by me, I will definitely do bad by you. And of course, that was then projected on God. You screw up in this life, you'll never get into heaven. And then along came the Protestants and said, no, it's a lot easier than that. You can screw up and you can just say, I still believe in Jesus. And that somehow magically runs you through the divine car wash. Not, none of the, all of that is a trivial version of, of that's like saying here, take this, uh, an, an, uh, take this uh, an abuse pill and you'll never have to drink again. It's a, it's a placebo. Religion for most people is a placebo. Most, in fact, if you look closely at most people's religion, you will see that what Marx said about religion is exactly right. It's the opiate of the people. 
Um, in the Catholic world, I think of people often, you know, I ask them how afraid, I mean, you know, how much, do, <laughs> well, you, you can hear the fear in the hope. I said, you know, are, do, do you think you will be with God forever in heaven? Well, I hope so. What, you know, the phrase I hope so actually means I don't have a freaking idea and I, I really kind of doubt it. And, but I hope I can make myself worthy of the whole thing is scrutiny. Okay. But what is the alternative? Where has anybody ever heard the alternative? You can't, you can't, you can't get sober just by saying, I want to be sober. You have to be willing. You have to be honest. You have to be open. We call that the how of the program, honesty, openness, and willingness. So, so to enter into a world that is that of God and not the world of the world. I'm tempted to get it open a number of cans of worms here, but we're not going to do that. Um, so, so let's just keep it simple like we've done so far in the gathering today. Christ comes into a world uh, addicted to a logic of the deceiver. What we call Satan, the evil one, it re, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, you can, I, I hesitate to say it's a metaphorical description of a reality. It's a metaphorical description of the reality of mass deception. Okay, the whole world is massly deceived about the nature and the pathway to peace. Okay, they're looking, they're trying to ensure peace through violence. And as my mother told me in third grade, after I wanted to beat Kevin Sullivan up after he hit me over the head with his book bag, she said, you can do that and your father will tell you it will make you a man and that may be the case. But let me tell you, as your mother, two wrongs never make a right. And there's more power in what I just told you than there is in what your father may tell you. But your father's not wrong. So we live in two worlds at one time. We live in the world of violence and have to be prudent in defending ourselves. And that's why Jesus said he knew this. He lived in that world. He was put to death by that world. He, he, he offered this world his world. He offered them an alternative, but he knew as sure as he was sitting there that this world would kill him. Unless a seed fall to the ground and die, it will not produce life. But if it does, in other words, if you resist evil, you will exacerbate evil. If you try to fight your addiction, you will only increase it. We call it in the program, we call it white knuckling. Yeah, I'm not gonna drink today. Well, willpower is not gonna do it. You see, this is the gospel in a nutshell. Holding on and trying to access it by my own power is gonna get me full deeper and deeper into the addiction. The more anxiety I have, the more pressure I put on myself to be good and not to, not to do the wrong thing, so-called, the more pressure I put on, the more I need to medicate my interior disposition because it is flaming with the flames of hell. I'm, 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 I'm intense, but it's an intensity that is not of God. There are two kinds of fires. There's the fire of the Holy Spirit, which is always consoling. It's the fire of recovery. It's the fire of, whew, thank you, God. And then there's the fire of hell where I'm going to make this happen no matter if it kills me. And it will kill you spiritually and physically to, to try to fight. So everything that I fight gains in strength. Again, that does, I hasten to say quickly, Jesus, and when Jesus tried to talk about this dilemma that human beings in this world face, he said, you have to learn how to be as wise as serpents and as innocent as doves. You have to be open to what I'm offering you like a child. Unless you become as a child, I cannot lead you into the life of true sobriety, which is joy, happiness, and bliss in the presence of the one I call my father. He is your father as well. 
You can live with as much forgiveness in your heart and as much peace in your heart. You can overcome the world of violence just as I am doing if you know the one I call my father. But everybody in the world, including your own parents and your own siblings and all your role models are going to tell you to do something differently. Unless a man leave his mother, father, sister, and brother, unless, his, unless a man hate all his mentors who are trying to teach him that two wrongs make a right, that violence can cure violence, that Satan can cast out Satan. Anyone who listens to the voice of the deceiver will be fit only for the fires of hell. I won't have to send them to hell. They will be in hell as a result of re refusing to leave their own logic. But the good news is this, and this is why I say everybody will be saved in the end. And anybody in addiction knows this. When I become sick and tired of being sick and tired, I will awaken to true health. Evil and misery is its own self-sabotage. Suffering always becomes its own worst enemy at the most intense point because people let go at a certain point. And then very often they either die or they become very peaceful. I've seen this happen a million, to million times, hundreds of times with people I've been with. I was just with a man this, uh, this week in the hospital who died of COVID. So I'm with him and he, he's very religious very afraid, wanted to go to confession, went to confession, you know, kind of taking out an eternal insurance policy, a second policy, because he had several already signed in the, in the safe deposit box of his soul somewhere. And then I came back the day before he actually died. And I said, I said, um, what was his name? Greg, I said, Greg, you, you were so anxious yesterday, and you were so insistent that I hear your confession. And even after I heard your confession, you still seemed so agitated. Today, you, you seem so calm. And, and these weren't his exact words, but I'm going to put it in the way I understood it. What he basically said to me was, I died to the fear of dying. I died before I died. He said, also, he said, while I, after confession, my mother, my mother-in-law, and my godfather, who are all dead, came to me and said, they're coming to take me tomorrow. So he had the unveiling, you see, and the other world was shown to him, and just one minute's exposure to the world that Christ was incarnate of, one minute of exposure to that world disarmed him completely of this world's logic. Everything of his past, he had that was the real absolution. He was absolved of his whole previous framework of God. He was beyond religion at that point. He was in the peace of Christ. Christ is the religion beyond all religion. Christianity is not another religion. Christianity is the end of all religions, replacing it with an immediate relationship with God, the intimacy of which, if we knew the intimacy of it, we would be almost instantly sober. We would be almost instantly peaceful. The problem is, for most of us, it takes years and years and years, number one, even to be exposed to the vision of true life in God. And then once we even begin to see the vision to exchange our miserable bowl of pori, our birthright in Christ, to, to exchange our miserable lives for the life that God is trying to give to us. I mean, you ask in addictions, you ask beaten women why they keep going back to the same guy. A beating, the violence of this world is preferable for most people to the uncertainty about knowing how to walk in God's world. And the church is meant to be recovery. Recovery doesn't say to the world, you can't drink. Christianity doesn't say to the world, you can't kill. It says to the world, if you get sick and tired 
of all the bloodshed, if you get sick and tired of all the divorce and the wrangling and the arguing and the self-hatred and the recrimination and the gossip and the backbiting and the backstabbing and the social climbing and the power politics, if you get sick and tired of the whole thing, we can offer you another way of life, but you must become willing. You must become like a little child. You have to, for, you, literally, to acquire the mind of Christ, you have to forget about everything you thought you knew about yourself, about the world, and about God. And God brings people to that place. He brings all people to that place eventually. He cannot not do it. And I'll spend a whole separate uh, gathering talking about the nuances of universal salvation. Almost every early Christian thinker following St. Paul, who said that God will be all in all, every almost every Christian thinker, with the notable exception of St. Augustine, believe that in the end, because it's impossible for people not to get sick and tired, if you were to run it for eternity, it's impossible for any rational creature, which we all are, created in the image and likeness of God, it's impossible for any rational creature to hold out forever to the alternative that God is offering them to their dying, destructive, miserable, suffering, addictive life. It's, it would be as impossible. So let's, let's compare humanity or anybody not in recovery. Let's compare humanity to a, to a thirsty man dying in the desert. He's desperate. He will kill anybody in his way to get where he needs to get. And then suddenly he comes over, comes across an oasis of water that offers him the alternative to his thirst. You would have to be utterly insane to think that you would even have to think about it for more than one moment. When people actually see God and see their lives in God, they can no sooner resist going to God than a thirsty man in the desert can resist going to the person who's offering him the living water. Okay, but short of that, if I don't see the oasis, or I don't even know the oasis exists, I'm going to prefer my, my bitter security to the uncertainty of something I can't see. That's why the best apologetic for the Christian church and the best, the best advertisement for AA or FA or whatever the AA 12-step group is. Their key line is, we, how, do, how did we grow so much? How did they go from two men in a little shack in Akron, Ohio? How did these two fall down drunks who held on to each other for dear life in 1934 how did it go from two men talking to each other about their addictive tendencies? How did it go for, from two drunks to millions of people finding new life through this AA movement and all the other 12-step groups that have, it didn't happen by promotion. There's no campaign out there. There's no AA evangelist. There's nobody on television. There's, in fact, there's nobody whose name you'll even know because the whole thing's anonymous. And by the way, they got almost the whole program from a Catholic priest living in St. Louis, Ed Dow, Father Ed Dowling. He gave Bill W. the, the outline of the 12 steps. Anyway, that's an aside. The point is, their key line is, how did we grow so much? How did the Christian church grow so much? Not by fighting the culture. They didn't fight the culture. They were happy to pay their taxes. They were happy to enter, in, in not exactly at the beginning, but down the road with Constantine. They were entered. They were willing to even be in the army. The early, the early, early Christians were not willing to be in the army because they knew that Christ said, those who live by the sword will die by the sword. And that's been true ever since, of course. So they didn't, they, didn't, they didn't survive by fighting. They weren't militant. 
fact, they were quite secretive. They wouldn't let anybody in who was not willing to make a complete change. And if you weren't willing, they said, come back when you are. And they had a three, two to three year test of a person's willingness. They would not even admit them to the fellowship, to the gathering, without that person showing their willingness. And then the door was open to them. So AA says we, 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 um, we, I'm trying to think of the exact tradition. It's, uh, we, 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 we spread through attraction, not promotion. Our power is, our power comes from attraction, not promotion. You can see this in the gospels. Jesus did, it's true, call people, but he called them when he saw their willingness. The first two disciples that he had were actually disciples of John the Baptist, who represents the old-time religion. John the Baptist was looking for a, a Messiah who would be militant. All the Jews were looking for a savior who was a warrior. They wanted a kick-ass, take names, take names later kind of guy coming from heaven after the fashion of David. Remember David, Saul slew his thousands, but David slew his ten thousands. Son of David, have mercy on me. They're looking at Jesus to be the next David, by which they mean they're looking at Jesus to be the guy who comes in and destroys not only the Philistines, but the Romans and every enemy that the Israelites have so that they can assume their rightful place as the rulers of God's kingdom. And Jesus said, if my kingdom were of this world, I would have legions fl fl flying to my aid, but my kingdom is not of this world. So you are a king, Pilate says. He says, yes, for that I came into the world, but I am offering you a way of reigning that has nothing to do with the way the world interprets reigning. Yes, I can teach you how to live, but you must die to the way you're living now. Are you willing to die in order to live? And they all said, the apostles all said yes. And then he looked at them and he said, you don't know what you're asking. <laughs> like last week's gospel, you don't know what you're asking. So it, it's, a, it's a complete surrender. It's a, complete, it's, 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 it's a conversion that is harder than turning around the Titanic. But the best thing for the people on the Titanic is to hit the iceberg. Then they begin to look for alternatives, okay? And Christianity then stands there as a lifeboat to the world's Titanic that will take everybody who is willing to leave behind all their possessions. You can't bring your piano on the lifeboat. It's not going to work. You can bring yourself. You can't even bring your children. They have to become willing themselves. You can't, you can't pass on what you have. If my son is alcoholic, which he's not, thank you, thanks God. If, if he was, I could not hand on to him my recovery. I can't give to another person what... I can only give what I have, and I can't give them that. So there is a now with, with so normally, and this is the the purpose of the gatherings. It takes it takes. I mean, I have just unloaded on you a a, vi, a part part of a small part of a vision. This this it it happened to Saint Paul in an instant. It, the logic of his world, which was a god like ours who needed to be placated, needed to be propitiated, needed to be sacrificed to, needed to be prayed to, needed to be bargained with and transacted with. I always say, if you want a thumbnail way of, of imagining what we're doing in the gatherings is we're, we're trying to replace a transactional model or a sacrificial model or a moralistic model or a legalistic model, or a forensic, commercialized model, an extrinsic, business-like relationship with God. You do this, I'll do this for you, 
A Catholic says, I'll do all these good things for you. I'll say all these masses. I'll say, get all these indulgences. I'll say all these prayers and I'll do all these good works. And then you will like me. That's a transaction, null and void. God doesn't care a bit about any of that. Or if you're a Protestant, you say, oh, those Catholics believe they can transact you with you through good works. I'm simply going to take you as my Lord and Savior. And Jesus says that transaction won't work either. You can't bargain with me either by having faith or by having good works. It's neither your faith nor your good works that prompts me in any way to offer you what I'm offering you, which is life with me in my Father. I'm offering that to you because of who I am, not because of who you are. You need to start looking through the world through my eyes, not your eyes. But that will require you going blind for a while. <laughs> and that's what exactly what happened to St. Paul when he was blinded on the road to Damascus by the light of Christ. That was the big pop I heard in that AA meeting. It was Paul coming out and saying, oh, my God. My whole world was a shitty brown, and now I see the light, but it was blinding to him. And the cataracts had to fall. And even after the cataracts did fall in his baptism, Paul says in the Acts of the Apostles, I then went down to Arabia for 12 years. And he doesn't say this, but the purpose was I went down there to figure out what was just being shown to me. Because I was being introduced to a world that was completely other from the world I'm in. And now I realize when Paul eventually started writing his letters after he spent that time in the desert asking the Spirit to exp explain to him what had just happened, he tried to articulate that in his letters. And if you read the letters of Paul, they're very difficult to understand because they do not fit into our logic of good and evil and, and bad and good and religious, religious laws and thinking. He says everyone who thinks they can transact things with God through a legalistic means is living under a curse. You are living according to the flesh. The spirit sets you free to become free with the freedom of the children of God. And then people said, well, does that mean we can just do anything? And Paul says, by no means. But nothing you do will make any difference until you're sober. You can't, everything you touch with your old way of thinking will turn to dust in your hands. Because you are thinking not as God does, you're thinking as human beings do. And human beings think they have to transact with God. Human beings exist because God desires them to exist in him, through him, and with him. And it's because we have allowed ourselves to be deceived by the deceiver, who in truth holds the entire world in his darkness that you must look towards the light of Christ to deliver you from the darkness, from your former ways to a new way of life. But the new way of life is not a new series of moral injunctions. The new way of life is something other than a transactional relationship with God. It's a relationship of immediate intimacy. This is what baffled the people about Jesus. They said, how will we know the kingdom is coming? And Jesus said, not through signs or wonders does the kingdom come. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Translation, you live, you exist. Your breath is the breath of God. You have to look no further than your own insides to see the life of God. Nothing you have comes from yourself. In yourself, you are no thing. I, you see what I put down for my little, um, my name today on my Zoom. When people say, who are you? You know, that's, that's what Jesus said to his apostles. Who do people say that I am? And so if you ask me who I am, I say what I wrote on my screen. I am he who is, 
in him who is I am. <laughs> I am he who is, I am she who is, in him who is I am. Where do you think you came from? Where do you think the idea of you began? It did not begin with your parents. They had no idea who you were going to be or what you were going to look like or what you would turn out to be. God knows all of that before he inspired your parents to be with each other. Our kids come through us. They don't come, they, they come through us. They don't belong to us. So we have a question here in the in the room. So yeah, that'll I, be a good I, chance. I do, and it came from the, today's reading from Jeremiah, who had an intimate relationship with God. Yes. Uh, it's okay if an alcoholic would say, try to project his problems upon God, not paying attention. I'm going to have Earl uh, tell you all on the Zoom what he's saying, so you can hear him firsthand and also see him. Okay. What I'm suggesting, I think, is that if an alcoholic or any of us, for any reason, try to project our problems upon God, that can be an indication of our intimacy with God, that we're willing to be honest with him. True. And that can be, could be, I think, part of, of recovery. Absolutely. That, yeah. That was... yeah, in fact, um, yeah. So, and that that's a, that's a great point that Earl is making here. And that's why I said earlier, uh, misery and redemption are dimensions of the same mystery. Uh, salvation, you know, remember when Jesus came into Jericho? God, I wish you guys were coming on the trip with me. When we go, when you go into Jericho, you remember Zacchaeus was up in the tree. Now, Zacchaeus was a tax collector, darkened and addicted to the world's way of thinking, making money on money. He was the tax collector. Everybody in the city hated him. He was a he was a Jew, uh, Jewing Jews out of their money. Um, the Romans loved him. The Jews hated him. Nobody like Romans hated him too because he was a Jew. The Jews hated him because he took them for a ride. He made money on making money from them for the Romans. So he was the archetypal broker and uh, you know bookie. Uh, so they hated him. And and of course Jesus just looked up at the tree and he said Zacchaeus. Now notice this. God. God from all eternity, God knew that he was going to look at Z Zacchaeus was created in the beginning for Christ to look at him in the tree. And that only for the purpose of manifesting God's own glory. All of us are created for one purpose only, to manifest the glory of the one who made us in all of our relationships. And that happens whether we are intending it to happen or not. And it happens even in our misery. Because Zacchaeus was miserable in one sense. He was happy in one sense because he was affluent. But he was miserable in another because he knew everybody hated him. And he had to take great precautions. You can be damn sure he lived in whatever counted as the gated community in Jericho in those days. Okay, but Jesus comes, he just looks up at him. Look at the, this is where the awakening occurred. Jesus is not saying stop collecting taxes. Jesus didn't say reform your life. Jesus didn't say take me as your Lord and Savior. He said, Zacchaeus, how about letting me have supper at your house tonight? <laughs> and Zacchaeus says, sure, come on over. And he's so moved by this. Jesus doesn't say, I want some of your money to give to the poor. He doesn't say anything. He just goes and has supper with Zacchaeus. He doesn't say anything. He just, he just is himself. And before they even get into the second course, Zacchaeus says, hey, I'm so happy you came to see me. Of course, he was expecting David the Messiah too. I'm so happy the Messiah came to see me. I'll tell you what, I'm going to give half of everything I own to the poor, and if I've defrauded anybody, I'm going to pay them back four times what I took from them. Attraction, not promotion. What does Now, here's the key point about our misery. This is the key point about the kingdom of God. This is Earl's point in saying that when I'm, when I'm, when I'm transparent about my misery, my misery is immediately taken away. Kind of. 
<laughs> I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. But the words that Jesus, so Zacchaeus says, okay, I, I just gave you a speech. Lord, I'm so I, I, out of my exuberance. I give away half of what I own. I'm surprised that Jesus didn't say at that point, half so far, so good. Because <laughs> remember with the rich young man, he said, give it all away and come follow me. And ultimately, you do have to give it all away. But in the beginning, Jesus doesn't even ask for half. He doesn't ask for anything. He just says, come and see. Come and see. His first invitation to the new life was to the apostles. I started to say that earlier. His first invitation to the, to the first apostles before he called any of them on the seashore were John and probably Philip, or James rather. John, no, not John and James. John and Andrew. Probably. It doesn't say. But in the Gospel of John, he's walking along. John the Baptist says, behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples of the Baptist say to the, Jesus, where are you going? Where do you live? And he says, come and see. And they come out of that encounter like Zacchaeus comes out of his encounter saying, I have to tell you the one we've just seen is the Messiah. And so the words of Jesus to Zacchaeus, coming back to Earl's point and my point about misery being salvation, hell being heaven, hell being the entrance to heaven. Hell is the entrance to heaven. It's not the destination. It's the place we all have to pass through in order to enter paradise. If I pass through it with a little bit of pain, we call that purgatory. If I pass through it where it feels like I'm being completely burnt up, as St. Paul says, all their works will be destroyed as if by fire that their souls may be saved. That's Paul's vision of hell as a final purification of our darkness and our addiction, a final detox, if you will. For some people, it may take an eternity, so to say, which means an indefinitely long period of time, but not forever. Eternity means an indefinite period of time. It does not mean forever with no end. It means a period of time appropriate to the place that the period of time exists in. So there's hell in this world and hell in that world. Okay, and time is different in that world. But anyway, the words of Jesus to Zacchaeus is this, and this is the main thing to see about this gathering and about the whole mystery that I'm talking about. Jesus says to Zacchaeus, today, this day, salvation has come to this house. This day. In other words, Zacchaeus just exited the hell of his miserly life. He hasn't fully exited because he's still, and we don't know what happened to Zacchaeus. Did he go back to that life? Did he become a follower of Christ? In some of the apocryphal gospels we have, look at this. Um, so the point is that salvation comes the moment I recognize my misery and awaken from it. I have awakened into the kingdom of God. Now, for most of us, that awakening is a momentary thing, just like an alcoholic says, I'm going to give up drinking today. And they really, 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 really mean it. They do mean it. This is the cunning, baffling, and powerful thing about addiction. And this is what non-addicts don't understand. An alcoholic says to his wife, who's about to leave him, I promise I will never drink again. I don't want to drink. I don't know why I drink. I don't want to do it. Bill Wilson, the founder of AA, said, chain me up to a radiator so that I don't drink. And that did not keep him from drinking. With every addict, you build a 12-foot fence, they'll build a 13-foot ladder. You can't out-con a con. And every alcoholic and addict is a pathological liar. But so are all of us without knowing it. The grace of addiction is you come to know it at some point because the addiction becomes so miserable that you become sick and tired of being sick and tired. 
The same thing happens in marriage all the time. The moment you let go, you say, I'm not, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not fighting with you anymore. I know more people who are divorced and are best friends than they ever were when they were married. And I'm one of them. Though I, my, life, my, my life with my wife was never miserable. It was just clear we were on different paths and that I was already married. And we agreed to disagree. And to this day, she remains got next to my son and maybe next to some of you on the gathering, some of you on the gathering, <laughs> uh, is the greatest, greatest natural blessing God has ever given me. My, my wife, who came into my life and took me away, for, or I, I went away from the priesthood to marry her, she saved my being a priest. She came to me at a point when my spiritual life was just about ready to go down the toilet and she helped me resurrect my spiritual life. I will be ever, in God's, in God's vision of things, she and I are now in the right relationship that he always envisioned for us. But even the lemons that we threw in his direction, he turned into lemonade. That's the thing about God. You cannot, God, if God were to exclude evil, he would be doing evil. God absorbs and transforms evil. That's the point of the cross. Christ overcomes evil by absorbing it, not by resisting it. And Christians themselves do still do not believe in that power because they are still hypnotized by the powers of this world that say, how can you let them do that to you? And unless I am anchored in God, the criticism, the gossip, the insults, the calumnations, the crosstalk, the slander will tempt me. And that's just what it is. The temptation to pick up a verbal argument with another person is just that. It's the deceiver trying to trick you into picking up the weapons of the one you want to battle. And both of you are Satan cast, trying to cast out Satan, and you're both taking each other straight down to hell. But the moment you acknowledge it, the moment you recognize it, the moment you confess, by, that is to say, the moment you make it explicit, immediately you are released from its slavery. This stuff is very subtle. No matter what the worst sin in the world is, the moment you say, I own this, you have been set free. Now, I said Zacchaeus was partially set free. It is true that when the person awakens from their addiction, they want to stop drinking, but they are not able to. They have too much momentum in the other direction. Their intention is pure. Their desire is right. This is, I, I didn't finish that sentence. That's what non-addicts cannot understand about alcoholics. When they make promises that they break, it's not that they're trying to be hypocritical. They, at the moment they make them, they desire them with all their heart. They really mean them. They are just not able to do it because it's not possible unless you're St. Paul. Or Bill Wilson. This is what happened to Bill Wilson, the founder of F.A. He had given up all hope. And it was in his hopelessness that he kind of cried out to he knew not what. And he said, help me. And a light filled him. And that it's like that guy I talked to in the hospital the other day. The doctor came in the next day. There is an alcoholic chained to a radiator because he's going to go lose his mind getting a drink. And the doctor comes in the next day. Dr. Silkworth comes in the next day at Towns Hospital in New York City. And there's Bill sleep as calm and as kind and, and as gentle as a baby in a crib. And the doctor says, what happened to you? And Bill says, I don't know what happened to me. I said, please help me, and I was bathed in a light, and I don't have a desire to drink today. And he says, and then he said, doctor, and if you've never seen the movie, my name is Bill W., 
starring James Wood. Go, go watch it a thousand times because it dramatizes this in such a moving way. I am always moved to tears watching this movie because it, without any religious language, though it does eventually have, because he does, Bill, Bill Wilson does finally come back to a kind of spirituality, but in the beginning he had none. And the doctor says to him, I don't know what happened to you. I'm a man of science. I can't explain what happened to you. All I know is that we've never successfully treated a case of alcoholism. So whatever you have today is better than what you had yesterday. And whatever you did to get it, keep doing it. But time will tell. And then, and then as the movie unfolds, Bill stays in the light and the light stays with him, kind of like St. Paul for a little while. And then Bill, then Bill had to begin to find out what does this all mean and how do I keep it? Because he was afraid of losing it. He knew how cunning, baffling, and powerful his addiction was. He knew that once I'm possessed by this desire to drink, I cannot not drink. I lose my willpower completely. And then it led him to Dr. Bob Smith, and they started talking with each other. And again, uh, I, you know, it's such a moving, uh, maybe I will recount this, we still have a little time. All this is illustrative of how salvation comes the moment you awaken and acknowledge that I have been deceived. Now that doesn't solve the problem because I now have to detox not just from the substance. I have to detox from the mental thought process. And that includes every thought I have about God. I have to forget about God to discover God. Just like I had to lose the priesthood to find it. That's what Jesus means. You must lose your life. That is to say, you must lose your life as you understand it to be. You must lose your identification with family, job, country, religion, to be a follower of mine. I am not going to introduce you to a new religion. I'm going to replace your religion with my relationship with my father. It's my faith in him that is your salvation, not your faith in me. When you put your faith in me, I simply connect you to the one I put my faith in. It's a participation in my faithfulness that makes it possible for you to be faithful to what I tell you. Jesus is the go-between between the Father and humanity. He is the God-man and the man-God. The coming of Christ is the divinization of humanity and the humanization of God. That's why that phrase that Rob so acutely drew our attention to in the prayer last week, God became man so man could become God. To our eyes, to our ears, that sounds like a heresy. Why? because we do not know God as the early church knew him to be a miraculous symbiosis of humanity and divinity. And within that symbiosis, we are all included such that we are capacitated to be partakers of the divine mind of God without for a moment ceasing to be created human creatures with limits on our understanding that are not restrictive of God. So that phrase, and I borrowed that phrase from St. Athanasius, though I could quote another 200 of them easily from other church fathers, to show you that the primary vision that we have not known of in our Western Church, Catholic and Protestant, since at least the fourth century, um, is still there. And it's what I've laid out in, in a different way today in the gathering. Um, I wanted to say this, though, about, about so, so with, with, so, so there, there has to be a, a, you know, in recovery, we would say, I have to mature in recovery. 
the more I, the longer I'm in recovery, the more serenity I acquire. Why? Because my stinking thinking, it's not the drinking that makes me stinking. It's the stinking thinking that gets me drinking. The thought always precedes the action. The will follows the mind. What the mind tells the will is good, the will will do. The will, my desire to do something, my power to do something, my will, my dynamis, Paul called it. The dynamic power within me is blind. It follows what my mind says is good to do. And if it says it's good to drink, then I will drink. If, it, if my mind in its deception promises me euphoria, but is actually going to deliver to me misery, my will is going to follow. My will is powerless to do anything that the mind doesn't tell it to do. Otherwise, I'm a sociopath where I do anything that comes into my mind. Yeah. Along that sociopath thing, a person who has reached where De they, they can understand their, their deification, their yeah. They come across a person who is being right. misled in their mind, yeah. and they think that what they're doing is going to bring them to a greater good. Not an alcoholic. Correct. Or someone who's addicted to violence. Or I'm going to commit an abortion. If somebody is Correct. committing violence against a person who has already reached the education, right. would their human self, you think, still have some fear? Of, yeah, probably. The question here is, if I had acquired the mind of Christ and I was as willing, I was that I knew that the deepest law of God's logic is that evil, which itself is an illusion, it's a form of deception, it's a trickery. Evil already always results from doing something we believed to be good at the time, like drinking but has turned out to be a deception. It's actually led me to a place that is hell. The end of, that's why we put the devil and, and hell together because the devil refers to the power of deception. Now, if you want to attribute it to evil angels, you can, I believe in that in, in part. But even when you have evil angels, the problem still lies with God because he allowed the he created the angels to begin with, and he allowed them to become evil. So the ultimate source of all evil, no matter how you slice and dice it, comes with God. But God cannot be the source of evil. So evil must be a power of deception permitted by God for the purposes of good. And that's exactly what it is. Okay. But in the meantime, it creates enormous misery. So evil is real in the sense that it's, the effects of deception are very real. The whole world is strewn with the results of deception. And deception is always presenting a created good as the infinite good. Okay, And the question from Julie is, well, suppose I've recognized all this, I'm in recovery, and I'm, I'm going to relate it to recovery because that's a good analogy to be able to understand. And the question was, if I had acquired the mind of Christ, if I, if, I am, if I am as intimately connected with the Father as he was, and that is the purpose of every human life, that is the goal of every Christian life, that's the goal of every human life. And God uses a multitude of, of ways of bringing people into that life, even people who have never heard about the Christian world or the name of Jesus Christ. Christ is the source and pattern for everything that is in this world. So an animist hugging a tree is still in touch with the logos of God, the word of God, being communicated to that uh, animist through the animus of a tree. That's why we talked a couple of weeks ago about trees have souls and cats have souls. And every, every I wanted to talk a little bit about that today as well, the theory known as panpsychism, but because God in himself is supra-conscious, Father, Son, and Spirit. Everything created by God partakes of a kind of consciousness which we call their anima, or their soul, their spirit, their life, their logic. Every, every tree knows when it's in favorable conditions. Every plant knows when somebody nice is taking, about, taking care of them. Every dog knows when his master is coming home. Every bird knows when to fly south. Everything in creation has a mind of its own, 
which is a share in the mind of God's own mind, which is that of the person of Jesus. So that's another gathering that we can talk about more at another time. The point here being, let's assume, and let's assume, because I know it to be true, let's assume a person, just like in recovery, has acquired a sober mind. Let's assume, let's, let's, uh, let's, let's assume now a person is in a right-sized mind. They are seeing things clearly. They are seeing things as God sees them. Will they, will they, and we could ask this of Jesus, was Jesus as a divine human being, a divine person, but a human being, not a human person, a human being, but not a divine, a divine person, human being. We are human persons and divine beings. Okay, that's another gathering important. And that speaks to Rob's question about God became man so man could become God. That's at the heart of this whole gathering, okay? But it is a deep mystery that our current form of Christianity cannot, we cannot understand it with the current form of our own Christianity. So I'm trying to invite us to slowly or quickly dismantle what we thought we knew about God and try to understand what Paul and the early church knew and thought about God. But let's assume that has happened. Let's assume now that there is a person, and I've known many of them in my life, who have been divinized by Christ and, and are perfectly sober. I don't think any perfect sober person would ever say, I, it's, I couldn't go back to drinking. But for, for re, people who've been in long, long time recovery, I know every alcoholic's always one drink away. But for some people, it's virtually impossible that they will ever drink again. They could, it's theoretically possible, but virtually impossible. And so translate that to the Christian life. Let's say there is a person who thinks completely with the mind of Christ. Paul certainly was one of them. I will tell you who else was one of them. All the Christian martyrs said we have so internalized the vision of Christ as one who told us to overcome evil with good, not with evil, not to return evil for evil, but to accept evil on its own terms, without being imprudent, without courting evil, without provoking evil, without colluding with evil, without enabling evil, but not to resist it with its own tools. Otherwise, we will become victims of it. Since we have so internalized that, we would rather be eaten by lions than worship Caesar as God. We do not agree with the mindset of a man who calls himself God, the emperor. We agree with the one who came from Nazareth that we acknowledge as our Lord. And so they were all executed for treason. They were executed for subversion. They were worshiping a Lord who was not Caesar. That's why Jesus was put to death by Pilate and Caiaphas, because he was loyal to a kingdom that was a threat to theirs. Okay. Now, the question is, if I was one of those early Christian martyrs, or if I was Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, or if I am a deified person who has been, through the gathering, <laughs> been brought into the mind of Christ. A little humble there. Go to confession this afternoon. Um, suppose I was such a person. Would I be afraid when somebody comes at me with a knife? Absolutely. Absolutely. Would I defend myself? Absolutely. Would I run like hell? Absolutely. Would I fight? Now here, and I, I, I'm, I'm not going to go down this road because here's where you get into the realm of ethics and the Catholic uh, gymnasts, the Catholic, Catholic ethical gymnasts always use this distinction to justify violence in self-defense. They say this. You have not only have not only have a right to defend yourself against evil, you have an obligation to defend yourself and your family from 
evil. And that's theoretically, that is true. Love demands that, okay? And what the church says is you do, you, you have the right, and, and again, this is something that I don't think, I don't, it, nobody knows what they would do until the gun is pointing right at their face. So I make no judgment about anyone. I make no judgment about myself. Listen, I live in a place where I hear nefarious activity going on outside the window of the room I'm sitting in right now at 3 a.m. in the morning. And I know it's not, uh, not uh, palatable creatures coming around here at that time. You know, I've debated for years, should I get a gun from my friend Ken? I've got a, I've got a little can of mace. <laughs> but I also know that when I'm pushed up against the wall, they would be proud of me down there in Louisiana in the way that I can come out fighting if I need to, especially for somebody I love. So what I would do, what you would do if they were coming to rape my wife, you know, the old Dukakis story about what would you do if they were coming to rape your wife? Those questions are, put them all beside the point, okay? The church says that even it's okay to, in those situations, the church teaches, this is not Father Phil now. I don't believe, well, I won't say what I believe because I don't know what I believe um, about what people would do. I know what I believe about what could be done, and, and, but I don't know what, about what should be done. But what the church says can be done is in a situation like that, even with respect to a nation, this is known as the just war theory. And I don't talk about this stuff at all because I believe if you do what I'm talking about on the gathering, all these other questions will either take care of themselves or become utterly irrelevant. I believe questions about national peace and justice were irrelevant to the early church. Most of all, because they were expecting Jesus to come again soon, but also because they lived as an alternative to society. So as long as society was not killing them, they didn't care what the hell society did. They just witnessed to society as an alternative that was better than what society was doing. When you're sick and tired of what you're doing, we've got something that you may want. And so you're always welcome to try it out if you want. And if you don't like it after 90 days, we'll refund your misery. You can go back out and keep drinking. That's how it works in Christianity as well as in recovery from addiction. The church says in those circumstances, whether it's with a nation or a man defending his family or defending himself in a knife fight, you can, in, 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 in the attempt to defend yourself, you can kill someone provided you did not intend it as murder. And you see this actually in the Middle Ages, you see a lot of honorable killing. I'm watching a, a HBO series now just to see the way the world was and is apart from Christ called the Game of Thrones, if you've never seen it. It's unbelievable. But people are so honorable. You know, they say, uh, justice demands that I kill you, but I do it with no animosity in my heart. And, um, and people who are being killed in that system where the honor code, you see, that is what Christ came to break. Christ came to break the honor code. You have offended my honor, therefore you deserve to die. Whether it's a, a pistol shoot down in Cajun land with two people squaring off in a duel. You have insulted my family. It is now the honorable thing to do to have a duel. This is the way of the world. That's the world in a nutshell. Go to the Middle East. That's exactly what reigns. You insult me, you insult my sister. You insult me. I need to take one of your firstborn children as a sacrifice. That will make it even. That's the logic of the world. That's the way of the world. That's the ruler of this world. That's the deception of this world. That's the sum and substance of Satan. And it's socially encoded in our very de social DNA. And that's known as original sin. And that's also known as our slavery to sin. And, and when everybody's a slave, nobody knows themselves to be a slave. But when God's free man came into the world, he came in to set the captives free. 
and Christianity is, are those who have willingly broken the chains of slavery to the world's rule of reciprocal violence in order to maintain the status quo. So I have to be willing to die to everything to live to Christ, and that's the reason the Wednesday gathering exists. So it's 11 o'clock, and I'll leave it at there for that. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Thank you to our newcomers.